you have a question, uh, we've got some microphones that'll come around and we can jump straight into question time for our panel. It can be for anybody, Joe Jericho, Sam Hull, Richard Heath or David Blackmore, if you'd like to ask a question. I might start things off if that's all right. And, and Richard and even Sam, this might be more towards you. You're talking a lot about, uh, in your talks about consumers and their preferences, about the idea of clean and green really being a path, path forward for agriculture. Um, it was referenced in yours. Uh, talk, Richard. I suppose in, in a world then with people campaigning actively against live exports, bobby calves, farm maps going up saying where different producers are, anti-GM and these groups aren't going away in a hurry, how can the idea of promoting more clean and green to the mainstream um, work in against some of those activist type campaigns that are going to continue for some time? Um. Great question. Um, so, working with consumers rather than against activists is the way forward. Um, there are a, many activist groups who have always been there, will always continue to be there, are more visible and vocal now because of social media. Uh, that you know, it's it, it's it's it's. If you think of a curve, a bell curve, um, you know, there, there's extreme proponents and extreme opponents at either end. Um, a lot of the time we spend, a, you know, a lot of time focusing on those extreme opponents that are never going to shift. Working with the middle of the curve, the, the, the bulk of the consumer, um, bulk of consumers, to uh, bring them on the journey understand their demands as much as tell them what agriculture is. It has to be a two-way conversation about, you know, their concerns about sustainability, about how agriculture can address that, about what sustainable agriculture is, and move that middle of the curve forward uh, is the way that, that we work in that environment, rather than getting too obsessed and concentrated on that 10% down the bottom. Sam, would you like to add anything to that? Or? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a tough challenge. It's um, someone said to me, you know, how, do, "How do you make the complex simple and the simple compelling?" Um, and, and we're dealing with a really complex issue. So um, it, it's partly through through giving information that allows people to make a slightly more informed choice. You, you can't give them too much. It's feeding from the from the fire hose. So small amounts of information. We've got a question out the back soon, but we've got one here. Would you like to start? Sure. So a question for Joe. So I, I think we all agree that alternative proteins is sort of, you know, looking at promising space, but um, I want to question your model because uh, when I look at the figures, and you know, I think you quoted it, um, you know, if I put my investor hat on, you, you sort of said, OK, if we, to get to that 3 million, we need a compound growth rate over 10 years of 43%. I can't find another food product that gets close to 43% compound growth rate. So. Yeah, what's the level of confidence in the model? Um, and I wish Dan was here, because uh, I'm here to take the glory and Dan did the work. But um, it is built up on um, a, a combination of what's happening within the market currently. And if I look at, um, I'm just going to refer to it for a second. Um, So you're looking at the 150 million through to one billion dollar growth rate, um, and it's based on um, uh, where we think that opportunity lies in terms of the um, value add, both direct and indirect, um, and the grocery and food service sectors. In terms of breaking down the model further, I'd be happy to discuss it further offline and um, connect you in. Yeah, I mean, I know what you put into model, but you know, at the end of it, you're sort of tested against the market, so. You know, if you look at the food industry, 43%. I mean, does anyone know anything that's got close to that growth rate? That's sorry. So that's the sort of test at the. But I'm kind of, but it's a low base, right? So that's where I I'm very hesitant when I look at compound growth rates and I see double digits like that. It makes me nervous. Um, but when I look at a small growth, small um, uh, starting points, that's where you get to large compound growth rates. So I, I was hesitant about actually putting in compound growth rates, but the analyst in me was interested in that. Uh, we've got one up the back here. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question's for you, David. Given how important sort of your story is to your product and your business, I'm just interested in your views on how important Brand Australia is and whether you care about it at all and what role it sort of could plausibly play in helping the, the growth of your business. 
That's a good question and it's something that um, is part of the reason why we went off and did our own. Australia generally has the hardest um, quality controls of anywhere in the world. I think it produces the greatest product in the world and if you want to add the clean and green and, and you can go into a whole lot of reasons why that is. But Australians are the worst marketers. I've, I've marketed it around the re I've been around the world marketing and we actually export now to 14 countries but I went to places like China in 1981 and so I've, I've seen it around the world. I, I, I've gone into different markets with a um, couple of pamphlets in my, in my uh, gear that I'm showing around and other countries go in with suitcases full of, of stuff to be able to market. So I was so frustrated with that Australia couldn't get their message across that we had the best product in the world, that we had the strictest regime in raising it, animal welfare, um, through the abattoirs, shelf life. It was, and it still isn't promoted today. I think that we could, you know, we're talking about lifting, lifting up the uh, quality grade to Japan on the, on the current exports back in 1990 by one score worth $200 million. We've got the best product, we should be promoting it as, and, and our product is a perfect example, is that you can produce a product as long as you market it well and, and get a premium for it. Now we're struggling with the online questions getting on the internet here, so if you have a question, it's a good chance to get it in, get your hand up and uh, we'll get a microphone to you as soon as we can. There's another one up the back there, we'll go straight to you, sir, if you'd like. Hi, uh, Rick Sinclair from Forest and Wood Products Australia. A question to you, Richard. Um, the Forest and Wood Products sector has invested a lot of money uh, over 20 years in independent certification. Uh, probably globally we spent mm, probably three to five billion dollars on this. It's had no cut through from a consumer level. Um, and that's with a whole system of independent audits. So I think I was just putting to you the challenge to actually try to make a, a certification system that actually will uh, have the, the outcomes that the Minister's looking for here. Um, I I'm, don't know whether I should say this since we're doing the actual project, but I'm certainly not as bullish as the Minister in terms of this is going to be enormous revenue streams coming to farmers for certification. This is going to be how we continue to access markets and how we stay in markets and develop new markets. That's going to be the biggest impact um, or the biggest requirement for these sorts of demonstrations of sustainability. Now, within that, right, so, so, so that's how we get into markets. Within that, David's sort of story, where individually you go and do your own thing, is still, I think, going to be the pathway forward rather than a certification scheme, scheme applying to everyone where suddenly everyone's getting more money. But to open the door, first of all, we need these industry approaches. While we wait for the next question, I might ask, address this to, to all of you if you'd like to, to talk about how it's relevant to your talks today. And that is the issue of climate change. And obviously it's a big one in driving people's decisions making that you were saying in yours, Joe, but is it something you're conscious of in your, bill, in your, um, in your own business, David? And, and for Sam and Richard, how does that play into like, the company decisions and the research decisions as you move on? We might start with you, Joe, and move down the, the table, if that's all right. Yeah, certainly. And I think sustainability is a huge uh, driver in terms of people's dietary changes and moving more to this flexitarian or reducitarian, that it is predominantly driven by sustainability. Yes, there are other concerns or issues around animal welfare, um, or health, but I think primarily the sustainability is um, a key thing. And, I, and I, I have to say, I feel like this is quite a recent thing in that the um, bushfires have actually significantly shifted the psyche, and I have no research to back that up at this stage, apart from just the conversations um, that have been taking place in the media um, and the general mood in terms of um, uh, where, what I'm reading, uh, that it's, it's become much more of a mainstream issue. David? So firstly, um, whatever's causing the unpredictable seasonal changes and the extreme weather, I mean, everything from, um, you just talked about the bushfires, but earlier in uh, last year, there was half a million cattle lost in a, in a flood. Um, you know, these, these climate change changes or the uh, seasonal variations are here to stay. We've certainly moved forward and said, okay, well, this is gonna be the new norm. If we happen to get a really good year like I grew up with, well, that's going to be a bonus. 
you know, but we're certainly farming now, trying to change crops um, that we can take advantage of the crop climate changing. Um, we, um, and have certainly as far as our livestock and animal welfare, we're certainly moving ahead that we've got to um, purchase more feed, we've got to grow more feed that we can take out of the paddock and, and feed to the cattle in, in um, more enclosed areas. And I don't mean feedlots, I'm talking about, you know, calves still calving, cows still calving naturally in the paddock, um, but taking the feed to them. And Sam, you mentioned you wanted to talk soil carbon in your in your talk and so forth, but also um, in your research and developing new products, is it's climate change something that's becoming more important in Syngenta? Front and centre, um, uh, yeah, the, I, I, yeah. There's four things: um, breeding crops that are more resilient, or move them to where they're more suited. Um, uh, Brown Brothers sold their vineyards in in the Hunter Valley and moved to Tasmania. Um, cotton production is moving north where there's um, uh, less expensive or, or more valuable water, e either way you look at it. Um, improving soil structures, so that relates to the glyphosate zero till piece. Um, remediate, there's a plenty of soils that we could be farming that we stuffed up in old school farming ways. Um, and the fourth is then obviously reducing emissions or sequester more um, involved in all of those, yeah. And Richard, well, this is almost a dixer for you and your project really, isn't it? But, but obviously it plays a major part in the reason you're getting involved in this space, I would imagine. Um, and look, an area that we've, we've sort of been commenting on for a while now at the Farm Institute and just really want to highlight that beyond the productivity implications, which are huge, um, and David has just mentioned, at, you know, at a farm business level, um, the, the, the implications to the business environment that farm businesses exist within are now real and inescapable. Um, as I mentioned, that you know, virtually every big company that you're going to deal with, that, that company's requirement to demonstrate how they're mitigating their climate risk is going to impact on the way that they provide products and services. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's real. Um, and it's having a big impact. Well, Warwick, just a point to add though, um, more carbon in the atmosphere actually produces more crop, more food. Um, so uh, whilst that's not a sustainable way to do it, um, we have seen crop production levels increase because of carbon levels increasing. So, um, but if know, it we brings with it a big flood or a big drought, that's yeah, the yeah, difficulty. There's also isn't another it? gap we'll have to fix when we fix the carbon. Yeah. Thing. I reckon that might take some time. Um, uh, do we have a question down here? Is that? Thank you. Um, question, I guess, primarily to Joe, but um, welcome others' um, ideas as well. Um, the rise of plant-based protein popularity seems very much to have come out of that idealist end of the consumer spectrum or the, the, the part at the end of the bell curve in terms of highly involved, interested in organic and natural and all those sorts of things. If that's where that um, interest in plant-based growth is, is coming or proteins are coming from, um, there seems to be a lot of products on the supermarket shelf that have very lost, long lists of ingredients that are highly processed and so on. How are consumers reconciling that or is that a, a future risk for plant-based uh, protein products? Yeah, it's a great question. I'll answer it in two parts. Um, first, in terms of, I think, um, the description Sam used earlier, Sam, I think it was the, um, you know, the bell curve in terms of you've got your extremes that are kind of leading it. I feel like it's pushed across in terms of much more mainstream. And you're seeing that on TV with um, Hungry Jacks and um, other mainstream McDonald's, et cetera, responding with plant-based um, burger patties as well. Um, the second part of that, in terms of the list of processed, I think I agree with you in terms of that is wonderful but on the other hand, it kind of pulls in two directions of going, hang on, I want, I want organic, I want as few um, ingredients as possible, I want as close to the natural ingredient as possible versus you're doing all this processing it to get it to the end state. Um, we're seeing some development in terms of only four ingredients to go into some plant-based um, uh, meat alternatives, uh, and that's a, a future innovation that's coming. But I think for me, the other part of that is um, uh, plant-based meat alternatives are a stepping stone. It's for people that had previously consumed a lot of meat and are trying to reduce the amount of meat that they're eating, and this helps them get there. The next step is you just eat plants. Got a question up the back. Sorry, right. Can I just have a quick shot at that one as well? Um, 
uh, so um, MLA do a whole lot of surveying each year on consumer attitudes towards meat and now recently they've been looking at plant-based substitutes as well. Uh, two years ago, 50% of um, uh, people that they surveyed that were trying plant-based uh, meat alternatives said that uh, it was because they believed that it was better for the environment and better for their health. A year later, 25% did. So in the space of a year, the awareness of the products and, you know, they're new, bright, shiny things that everyone are excited about and going out and having a try. The, the awareness is, is raising really quickly about whether they are actually sustainable and whether they are actually good for your health. Now, I see this as a real opportunity for the Australian development of plant-based proteins, which is still pretty nascent and pretty early, um, because we have a chance now to develop protein extraction industries that are sustainable. So there's a whole lot of different ways you can extract, you can um, extract proteins from pulses and so on. Some of them are terribly resource intensive, use just as much water as growing the meat in the first place, for instance. There are other techniques that are much more sustainable and then the products that you develop out, them, out of them don't have all the additives and so on and you know I'm happy to say that a lot of the the early stage Australian based plant protein companies are looking at that again as the sustainability message right so let's keep this clean and green sort of image of Australian produce going and our plant based protein sector can be clean and green as well as our animal based protein sector and we're going to need all of it. Watch this space. Next uh, question. Hi, um, it's Jay Gomboso from ABES. Thank you. All four presentations were absolutely excellent. Uh, my questions to David, um, just in relation to uh, Wagyu beef fraud um, and whether or not you've um, been subjected to um, producers or exporters trying to um, promote a product as Wagyu beef when it actually isn't, um, have you had that um, affect you? And if so, what have you done about it? Can you, can you help? I'm sorry, I'm, a, That's I'm right. an um, old farmer who grew up in tractors without earmuffs and cabins and uh, half... Wagyu beef fraud, have you seen it? Have your, has your products been um, uh, defrauded or the, the brand of Wagyu beef more generally? OK, so there's a couple of things. Um, I'll just add a bit more of the story for that for you. In Japan, the only time you're allowed to use Wagyu as a descriptor of beef if the beef is 100% Wagyu genetics. Higher than 90% of beef described as Wagyu in outside of Japan is probably only 50% or, or certainly not 100% Wagyu genetics. So there is a difference between 100% Wagyu and crossbred Wagyu. Now the crossbred Wagyu does lift at that three marble scores or three quality grades that I was talking about in my speech. As far as um, counterfeit, yes, we've um, had our label on numerous occasions copied uh, off our website and we always put an insert inside the cryovac bag with our meat so that then the bag sealed. So you think, yeah, it would, we got it covered. But uh, that was no issue in Japan. The label was covered, copied, a cryovac bag was copied they all have a uh, plant number, abattoir number on the bag. They just happen to copy a bag that we've never killed at. And they also were um, using beef in Japan with our label on it that we never ever sent those cuts to China. So, uh, um, yes, we have had substitution or what, counterfeit. Whatever. What do you do about that? Uh, we, look, we got a son-in-law who uh, is uh, an executive at Google and we reckon he'd come up with all the answers. But in actual fact, there is no, no answer other than what we finished up doing was, um, you know, we talked about whether they could take a, a photo of the barcode on the, on, off, off the phone or whatever, but none of all that can be copied. So um, what we did in the end is that we went over to China, met all the people that, and it's not that many because that's only in five-star hotels in China, met all the chefs and said, if you aren't buying our beef from this distributor, it's not Blackmore beef. And that's how we got around it. And just to give people an idea, what's that beef selling for in those, to uh, those restaurants? We would have, you know, like the time it hits the restaurants, or just for instance, in, and it'd be dear overseas, but Rockpool, Melbourne, um, Sydney, Perth, um, our beef on the menu is at $650 a kilogram. <laughs> that's go. on your plate. I mean, that's cooking. We don't sell it to them. We're really happy they get that for it because they, they keep coming back wanting to buy our beef. But, um, like, we're not talking, 
you know, I can, I, I know at the same time we had trouble of our beef, that you could buy um, Ben Folds Grange in China, exactly the same label, everything was exactly the same, except the P was a B. Um, <laughs> and, and so that was an issue for them. They actually didn't do a lot of complaining about it and neither did we, and, but just as a lesson, there was a French company who was getting their, their wines, um, the labels put on and their wines counterfeited, and they went to town. They did it. What happened is they lost all of their sales in China because the Chinese people weren't confident that if they bought this brand that they were getting that brand. Mm -hmm. So it was better basically to shut up and, and try and fix it behind. I mean, you know, everyone's heard about gold Rolex watches counterfeited out of China. It's, it's, no, it's mine's, not real mine's hard legit, to, it's got two R's in it. Um, <laughs> uh, we've probably got time for one more question. There's one up the back just on the way uh, there, so we'll jump straight into it. If you're worrying if you can't afford that, the RBA has just cut interest rates, so <laughs> you're, pr you're probably right. You can probably get at least one stake. There we go, we'll go to our last Thank question. Thank you very much. My name is Mombi from the Department of Agriculture. My question is to Sam. Um, you've got push factors on the glyphosate issue and no non-acceptance of GMOs and you're trying to be sustainable. So what's the future of crop protection in about 2050? Um, I'm not too sure, um, uh, but I guess I'm expected to have an opinion at times because that's where we invest our money. So um, it's probably not with the technology we're using today um, for right or for wrong, um, but we always find something better. So I think um, uh, Chuck mentioned uh, glyphosate is better than what we had before, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's right or wrong. So I think it's constantly trying to find something better. Um, biologicals is, is a big area of investment, you know, massive area of investment. But the reality is um, if I was to try and register a glass of wine as a fungicide, we wouldn't be able to do it today because it's too toxic um, for all kinds of reasons. Yet that's the end point that we drink. So I, I guess um, we're always having to try and find something different. So therefore biologicals at the moment is certainly an area that's being accepted, um, but not necessarily being safe. And what's driving that is that residue piece, not so much the organics market, that's nice. It's a bit like selling um, you know, Blackmore's Wagyu. Uh, High-end consumers can afford it, but it's not a way of sustainably feeding the planet. And, and I think or, or, you know, organics is not driving our innovation. Um, nil or zero or very close to zero residues is, is, is driving that. So any crop protection product that helps manage a crop, maintaining sustainability, driving productivity for the farmers and has no residue, um, well, that's sort of where we're going to head. Breeding practices continue to change as well. Uh, it used to be transgenic, so I'd take a piece of a fish and I'd put it into a crop and that would control a different insect. Okay, what about intragenic, where we take something from that crop and swap it around, a bit like in the, in the Wagyu example. Okay, a little bit more consumer savvy. I, I can handle that from a science perspective. I can talk about that from a science perspective. Um, and then there's technologies sort of that come back closer to natural breeding. Um, so yeah, if it meets the consumer need and it meets the farmer need and it helps biodiversity flourish, that's where we will invest. So we'll probably finish just there then and I can't use wine to irrigate my veggie patch though by the sounds of it, so that's quite disappointing. Um, Joe Jericho, Sam Hull, Richard Heath, David Blackmore, thank you so much. I think you've started a lot of conversations today.